Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Adult Education Today on Daylight Savings Day. We are really honored to have Guillermo Torres with us this morning. Um, thanks to Penny Fanchez of Adult Ed, who's not on this call right now, um, but I'm sure she'll be watching later for coordinating Guillermo speaking with us today. So Guillermo is, has been working for Clue Justice, which if you don't know that organization, it stands for Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice since 2011. And his work right now primarily focuses on immigration. And so Claremont UCC has relied on Guillermo as a resource as we've done our asylum work. And we've had multiple phone calls with him over these last couple of years. Um, we've worked a lot with um, uh, Interfaith Network for Human Integrity, uh, but Clue, especially in the LA area, has been doing a lot of incredible work. And so the recent collection we took up for asylum seekers who've been out um, and who are now living at some area churches was coordinated by Guillermo and Clue. He's done other work such as helping create living wages and better working conditions, um, educating congregations about immigration issues, helping train leaders to visit people who are in detention, working with congregations to become sanctuary congregations, just a lot of incredible work. So we are so honored to have you with us today, Guillermo, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me into the space. Uh, uh, and I'm so honored to be here. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, you said that uh, my organization is actually an interfaith organization, and I've been with the organization for about 10 years. And um, and as uh, we speak about how congregations can support asylum seekers and uh, and uh, refugees, I think you guys also sent a donation recently, and I want to appreciate uh, uh, that donation that's helping us to free people from those horrible detention centers. Uh, and today, we, I want to talk a little bit about how uh, congregations can support asylum seekers and and as you know, as you all know, that the last four years have uh, have been uh, have been horrific uh, when it comes to the policy of, of immigrants and asylum seekers. Uh, these policies had no sense of uh, of uh, humanity, no sense of compassion, no sense of truth, no 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 sense of any connection to the suffering of immigrants. The last four years, they've been horrific. So, thankfully, we have. Uh, uh, we have love now and we have light and we have hope now uh, with the new administration. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit today on, uh, on uh, the issue of, uh, and, it's just, and, 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 it's recent, and it's making recently news again uh, about the humanitarian crisis with the unaccompanied minors uh, currently uh, arriving at the border. Uh, this crisis goes back to 2014 also, uh, when it was in the news when about 60,000 unaccompanied minors uh, 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 showed up seeking uh, asylum. And just, just this morning, uh, I was uh, watching ABC News uh, with uh, uh, the morning shows with, uh, and where uh, Pelosi was there speaking about this humanitarian crisis again uh, around the unaccompanied minors. And, and, and the reason why I wanna focus a little bit on that is because I wanna give you some of the reasons uh, uh, why uh, the unaccompanied minors and many other immigrants are freeing uh, to seek asylum, but, but mainly focus a little bit on the North, what is called the Norton region uh, triangle, which is uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and, um, and El Salvador. And why are some of the reasons why uh, they're being forced to free to seek uh, refuge, to seek asylum um, uh, from these countries, uh, even though we are helping, uh, and then I'll touch base a little bit about the other immigrants too from other countries, but uh, but I want to try to be uh, focused on that on on, the, on that part of the world. Uh, I did a I, I after doing some research a while back when we were when we uh, when we saw the crisis unfold in 2014, uh, there was a report by the uh, by the Center for American Progress that stated the following reasons uh, why. Uh, these unaccompanied minors and many other uh, immigrants, uh, including families, were freeing from this region. And according to, the, to their data, uh, it stated that El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala were among the most five dangerous um, countries in the Western Hemisphere in 2015. El Salvador's homicide rate has recently, had, had, had recently deteriorated so much that the country is more than 24 times as dangerous as the United States. 
In 2015, the murder rate in El Salvador jumped nearly 200% from its rate in 2012. And in August 2015, uh, El Salvador uh, was, was the most deadly month in El Salvador since the Civil War ended in 1992, where an average of one murder occurring every hour. San Pedro Sula Honduras had a homicide rate of 111 per 100,000 people, making it the second most dangerous city in the world after Caracas, Venezuela. San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador, was the third most violent city in the world in 2015. In addition, the residents of, uh, of those three countries, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, report that they pay annually about $650 million in extortion, fee, extortion fees because they are threatened uh, with uh, death and violence if they don't pay those extortion fees. And uh, one more note that those countries uh, the highest homicide rates uh, for women uh, in the world. Uh, so this was a, a study uh, that was released and uh, what that points out to that the main reason why unaccompanied minors and many immigrants uh, uh, from, Central, from this region of Central America, including the caravans that uh, for the last couple of years, you see some of the caravans um, are freeing uh, are extreme violence crushing poverty, abandonment, and the gangs. Uh, when, when, uh, when we were, when we were um, addressing the issue of unaccompanied minors back in 2014, uh, there was a, a young man and a mother with three children that had came to seek asylum uh, from, El Salvador, from, El, from Honduras, but the husband was from Nicaragua. The father, he left Nicaragua because his father um, was uh, the, the, the military or the police came and, sh and, and killed his dad and, um, and burned the house down. And then he fled to Honduras um, where he met his wife. And they had a little business in Honduras, uh, a little store, and, uh, but the gangs were extorting them. And uh, one, uh, at a certain time, the uh, the family, uh, the little girl got sick and they couldn't pay their medical, uh, they couldn't pay the extortion fee no more because they had to take the little girl to the hospital. So the gang came one, the game, the gangs came one night to the business and, uh, and told the father and, and, and demanded that they pay the extortion fee. And they told him they couldn't because they're, they're, they had to pay all these medical expenses for their little girl. So they ended up uh, shooting the husband a couple of times. And then when the wife screamed and, and screamed, uh, they ended up stabbing her almost near the heart, uh, this family. And this was one of the families that we helped, uh, 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 that we helped uh, as asylum seekers that they came to the US to seek uh, uh, refuge. Just this Wednesday, I went to the church in San Bernardino that, uh, that we have immigrants uh, that have been uh, released from detention uh, and a kid that was actually an unaccompanied minor. And when he came here, he was under the age of 18. He came from Honduras. And, and uh, I went to do an intake because he just got released from detention a, a few days ago from Adelanto. And he's 21 years old. And I asked him um, a little bit about, you know, uh, why he left and uh, why he left Honduras, and um, and so he came, so he told me that he came. He was under the age of eighteen. He was put in a foster care system in the U.S. And then after he turned eighteen, he was put a, put up in the detention center because unaccompanied minors, when there's no when there's no sponsors or no family members that takes them into their, they they have them locked up in these. Uh, uh, either foster care or these uh, uh, so, so-called shelters. And then when they turn 18 and they haven't won their asylum case yet, they send them to adult detention center at 18 years old. So he was locked up in detention. I was talking to him uh, uh, Friday actually that, that I went to see him. And, um, and then I told him, why did he free? And he said, um, he said, because his father, he, he lived with his father since he was a kid. And his mother was not present in, their, in his life. And his father was a member of the Mara Sabatucha gangs, his father. 
And I didn't want to push him no more and ask him what he's, uh, but he told me as a kid, so his father was in the Mara Salvatucha gang and he saw things that were horrific um, uh, by his father, by the gang. Uh, he, he saw uh, killings, he saw, uh, he saw a lot of violence. And, and that's why he fled uh, uh, to seek asylum as another company minor originally. Um, and he just got released from detention. Uh, but uh, if you see, this is just uh, one story um, uh, of many, many thousands of stories of, of, uh, of, of immigrants from that region that are coming because the violence of the gangs are so extreme. Um, uh, and then some have, uh, and then you have the issue of abandonment. But the statistics that I gave you are pretty, are, uh, tell the story of how violent these three countries, uh, Salvador, Honduras, and uh, Guatemala are because of the gangs. And that's just the gangs. Uh, we haven't talked about the police or the military, uh, but you see this uh, highlighted in the, in the caravans. And then you, recently you saw the, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, Honduras, the hurricanes that displaced so many people, destroy uh, so many little towns up in the hills and, and, and some people died and, um, and they destroy all their homes, right? Uh, uh, in addition to this young man, we just got uh, a, a family from Haiti um, that we just took into a church about a month ago in South Central Lake that opened up for, uh, for uh, uh, housing uh, asylum seekers. And um, this, uh, this is a husband, a wife, and, and a nephew that they, they raised him as a son that fled Haiti. And Snai, uh, he's shared the story a couple of times in because uh, I just did a presentation, uh, two presentations at two synagogues the last uh, the last month. And Snai was with me presently to share his story. And uh, and uh, he was sharing that uh, a senator uh, uh, he was working for a government official in Haiti, and this other senator uh, from Haiti uh, came one day to his work site and said, uh, "You must work for me." Uh, and he said, well, uh, uh, he wanted him to leave the other official and come work for him. And he said he, he could not do that because uh, he was happy where he was at working uh, uh, and he had good salary. So this senator said, well, if you don't work for him, if you don't work for me, you cannot work for anybody else. And, and then uh, he left. Uh, and then a couple of months later, this guy, this senator, sent a gang of of a couple of of, of, of people uh, to his work to his work site. And when Snai left on his um, to left home on a motorcycle, uh, they started following him. This gang, and then they opened up fire. They started shooting at him, and he fell on the motorcycle. He fell when he they were chasing him. And the only thing that saved him is that a patrol car showed up. And the guy spread, but they screamed at him, we're going to kill you. We're going to find you. He broke his leg, uh, his left leg, and his, he has metal crates on his leg. Uh, after uh, he recovered a little bit and left the hospital, uh, a few months later, he, was, he went to a market with his wife uh, in Haiti. And in that market, the guys, uh, some, uh, uh, some guys all of a sudden scream at, screamed at them and said, there he is. Let's kill him. And they recognized him. And the same gang that was following him on the motorcycle started uh, chasing him. Him and his wife fled, and they went home. The, the next day after, that gang showed up at his home, and it was a building with many, with many apartments. And they started shooting the whole complex because they didn't know where he lived. They hid in the neighbor's house. Uh, they fit in the neighbor's house, and uh, uh, and, uh, and the next day they disguised themselves as they were, they, they, they disguised themselves wearing him and his nephew start uh, dressed up as women, women clothing. And they left him, the nephew and his wife, and they left the Republican Republic. They borrowed, uh, they borrowed money uh, from his family and friends. And they left the Dominican Republic and they left to, uh, uh, and they had to go to maybe 10 or 15 countries to get to the US. Uh, one of the places that they had to travel on foot for like 11 days was Panama to the jungle where there's snakes and gorilla. They saw many people dead. So they fled, they fled, they fled until they arrived to Mexico. In Mexico, they were victims of a, a, of a robbery, assault, you know, um, 
uh, they took their money. So, uh, so this family uh, just got released from detention and their house are one of our uh, Methodist churches. Uh, and uh, they just uh, they just uh, arrived at our Methodist church about a month and um, and two weeks ago. Uh, but these are some of the asylum seekers uh, we're helping. And one of the things that uh, uh, one of the things that I noticed that when asylum some of the asylum seekers when they're not released and they're put in these horrible detention centers. And some of you might know about the horrible conditions going on at Atlanta Detention Center. Uh, the spraying of chemicals. Uh, uh, the issue of COVID-19, where they were mixing people, negative people with positive people, were mixing them in the same uh, in the same uh, uh, units. And we've been doing advocacy for against Adelanto for about three years. We started, we created a visitation group to visit immigrants in detention, so they could be in that space of pain and suffering and be with the immigrants, and amplify their voices of any abuse that was going on in detention centers. Uh, three years ago, we helped uh, liberate nine asylum seekers from uh, uh, Central America that were on a hunger strike after they were physically assaulted and purpose sprayed. And we helped initiate a civil rights lawsuit that they won uh, recently. Uh, we helped them bond out and we put them in many, and then those who didn't have a home, we put them, placed them in some of our churches. Uh, that was three years ago, we started that program. Uh, um, as, as far as visiting immigrants in detention center in Atlanta who has a history of medical negligence, uh, uh, just right now, we have an issue of, of, of water contamination and in, in some of them are getting sick from something called, I think, Polari, where they have, they're getting bacteria in their stomach and we just, and we just blew that up on the news with the uh, Shut Down Atlanta Coalition. But, but one of the things that, uh, that helps uh, asylum seekers or immigrants in detention is when they don't have a, uh, they don't have a, a housing, a, a friend or a family member to sponsor them, right? Uh, they will not be free from detention center that, uh, if they don't have a house, a place to go to, right? Uh, so, but those uh, detention centers have a, a horrific history of medical negligence and, and suffering and uh, civil rights violations, human rights violations. And, uh, and some of these, uh, and you could imagine these refugees, asylum seekers are coming to seek asylum and they put it in places uh, as horrific as uh, those places, uh, detention centers. So we have a witnessing program going on there at the Adelanto, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, and thankfully that new administration has a little, bit, a little bit more sense of humanity and compassion, but that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that we do not still need to do advocacy and, uh, and, uh, and, and amplify those voices, right, uh, of suffering uh, in those uh, detention centers and amplify the voices uh, of the, um, asylum seekers. Currently, we are part of the welcoming task force of California that's working, that's wor working to help uh, the asylum seekers that were, uh, that were at the border of Mexico. The, the stay in Mexico policy by the Trump administration kept many people without, uh, uh, the, uh, without being able to process their asylum seekers or, or their due process. Um, um, so now, they are starting to process the asylum seekers at the border. So we're working with a coalition of some of our immigrant rights organizations, some of the churches in San Diego that are partnered with us, uh, the Methodist Church. Uh, I'm part of the California Immigration Task Force of the United Methodist Church. We have a minister, uh, uh, a minister that takes care of concerned um, border ministries at the border uh, between uh, San Diego and Tijuana. We just did an item drive of a PP equipment and other items that because our uh, allies in San Diego requested that they needed all these uh, support. Uh, uh, we're working with, uh, so that coalition has a couple of different faith communities, or the immigrant rights organizations, the Jewish Family uh, Refugee Services in uh, San Diego. Uh, so we're working to support now that the process is starting to, uh, uh, to happen at the, at the border. Uh, that's, uh, those are current efforts going on in addition to uh, to what we're doing, what we've been doing for years, uh, in helping recruit and organize congregations to uh, sponsor to uh, sponsor housing um, and uh, and uh, food, uh, well, housing mostly, to, so that these asylum seekers could get released from detention centers or they could be processed to the border. Right. So, uh, one of the projects that uh, so that project we kind of redefine it. We've always been sanct crew has always organized sanctuary congregations. But those were in the past used to defend uh, people who face immediate deportation and to put them in sanctuary. But 
we started going to congregations because they had all these spaces uh, that were not being used. And because people, uh, and because of COVID-19, people were not taking people in their homes because of the pandemic. So we, we started this project called Shelter in Praise, which is a freedom of immigration project for asylum seekers who otherwise would not be able to be free from detention or not be able to be processed at the border because they don't have a house, a housing sponsor. So what we do with Shelter in Praise is we recruit and organize congregations to let us use their spaces. Uh, and they partner with my organization and we uh, convert those rooms, uh, rooms that they have uh, unused and we put beds in there. We put, uh, 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 you know, things that they need. We raise money to uh, get all these uh, spaces ready. Uh, some, uh, and, uh, so that, that way these congregations, uh, if they have those spaces available, we can use them to house and sponsor immigrants so they could be released. Just like this young man that I spoke to you about that just got released this week, uh, who's uh, suffered horrific violence uh, and saw horrific violence uh, because of his father's uh, tied to the Mata Salvatrucha gang. So we, uh, through the Shelter in Praise project, uh, we sponsor housing uh, through the congregations that uh, are part of this program uh, where we were able to house immigrants uh, so they could be released, uh, especially those that are seeking asylum, right? Uh, but there's many other ways, that's just one part of the program, but there's many other ways congregations could support the uh, uh, the asylum seekers, in addition to doing advocacy against Adelanto Detention Center and, and closing and shutting down that facility. And, uh, but uh, if, you, if congregations cannot physically house an, an immigrant, uh, then congregations can support in other ways, whether it's offering accompaniment and being in that space with immigrants that get released to congregations, they need people to connect to, they need people to walk with them, they need people to befriend them, to be so they won't be lonely in these congregations because, you know, at these congregations we don't have case managers, we don't have social workers, we're not a professional shelter. So, uh, it's very important. So when a family or an individual arrives and starts living at this one of these congregations, uh, that they have a support uh, community there to walk with them, show them the city, uh, support them uh, uh, morally, uh, provide mentoring for them, and kind of. Uh, help also sometimes navigate the, the rounds around the city. Uh, also, they also sometimes need uh, transportation to hearings, to court hearings, to medical appointments, right? Uh, uh, but just somebody there to support them. Uh, for example, in the case of the San Bernardino Church, that church gave us five spaces to house to to use for housing that we converted. Like I tell, uh, like I tell you, we put beds there. We got drawers, we got blankets, uh, people donated some, we bought, when there's no beds donated, we buy them. Uh, when there, we bought blankets for them, we, uh, towels, uh, per, people have been donating personal hygiene uh, packages, uh, things like that, right? So, and then there's gift cards to supplement. Uh, some of the churches have food pantries, but that's not enough. So some of the uh, other congregations who cannot physically house somebody, uh, they are able to provide gift cards to Target or to Rouse Food for Less. So, you know, uh, the other support we give them is a prepaid cell phone so they could be able to navigate, call their family, connect with uh, their court hearings, check in with their lawyers, things like that. Uh, uh, so accompaniment, uh, logistic items that these congregations need. Uh, the other thing is, the other way congregations could support asylum seekers is that, um, uh, that they, uh, you know, asylum seekers now are not able to get a work permit for a year now. Before it used to be only, uh, uh, I think, about 300 days, uh, 180 days or 380 days. Now, under the Trump administration, they cannot get a work permit for a year. So they cannot work. Uh, if they do it, they have to do it under the table. Some of them do it, some of them don't, but they could risk their asylum case. So another way congregations can support is partner and, and sponsor a family financially, whether it's $100 a month, $200 a month into they're able to get under, uh, that helps them cover some of their medical, you know, it's, uh, another thing that we help uh, the immigrants is with medical supplies, uh, their medicines. Uh, we had a couple of immigrants that had mental illness. We had a couple of immigrants that had other uh, sickness. So some of the funds that we collect for these, uh, this, this program is to buy, is to be able to uh, buy their medication. We have a discount pharmacy that we work with and uh, we're able to get discount prices, uh, thankfully. Uh, some of them are able to get insurance, some of them are not. 
So the, uh, all the funds of the shelter and project uh, goes uh, for these, uh, these costs related to housing them at these congregations until they're able to make the transition. Uh, but yeah, but sponsoring, but for example, uh, this kid that just came or this family from Haiti, uh, they don't have no uh, financial support other than donations. We give them when we get general fund, but if a congregation wants to sponsor and help them, but not only uh, sponsor them financially, but also, uh, but also to get to know them and walk them and get to and know that family that they're sponsoring and uh, get to know them. We want, we want that connection to happen, right? But yeah, but that's a little bit about the work we do with asylum seekers. We have, our network is really big, but, uh, and many congregations are supporting uh, people sometimes also support us asylum seekers by, create, by donating to a bond fund where we can bond somebody out if it's a small amount and it's not too big. And sometimes uh, uh, people because of congregations support that a bond fund or, or set, to set someone free from detention, including an asylum seeker that might have a bond set or we also use the funds sometimes to sponsor an attorney for them because not all of them have attorneys. And if they don't have an attorney, it's gonna be very difficult to win their case. Uh, but that's what the, uh, uh, that's the work that we've been doing uh, to show a sense of humanity and compassion and to make sure that these uh, uh, asylum seekers uh, see of, uh, receive uh, human compassion, uh, human dignity, not cages, not horrible detention centers that have a, a horrific history of medical negligence and abuse and people dying in the detention center. So uh, that's a little bit of our uh, program around uh, 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 shelter and praise uh, and supporting asylum seekers. But congregations could get, like I, like I described, could get involved in many different ways uh, to support asylum seekers, not just financially, but also uh, uh, right now, for example, uh, we're recruiting a volunteer to teach English to the asylum seekers of the immigrants that are in the churches by Zoom. So I just connected with Ben the Ark around that. Uh, and there's other ways you could get about and doing advocacy around. Uh, right now we have a, an action being planned at Adelanto Detention during Passover and Holy Week. It's being uh, planned by uh, uh, the rabbis and some of our Christian leaders the, uh, in Bawa, the Presbyterian of the Pacific, the United Methodist uh, uh, California Pacific Conference, the uh, Ben the Ark, the, and the LA Episcopal Diocese are, we're having meetings uh, every Sunday night to plan this action, which is called Let My People Go. It's gonna be a car caravan taking place on March the 30th during Passover Holy Week at the Adelanto Detention Center to highlight the new uh, uh, water contamination and, and immigrants getting sick in there uh, and to keep pressuring the Adelanto city officials to stand for human dignity and not cages. So I'll stop there and see if uh, all of you have any questions uh, or anything you want to ask me about. I had my hand raised. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Hi, Guillermo. It's Denise Spooner. You and I have uh, connected over email, so it's nice to see you in person. Nice, um, nice, one of you. the a couple things I want to let you know is that um, some of the members of our community here, including our um, Board of Mission and Social Action, are going to be meeting with uh, Representative Judy Chu sometime this mm -hmm. month um, and to alert her to the our support for the U.S. Citizenship Act, but mm -hmm. also to encourage her in the ways in which that piece of legislation is not dealing with the issues like around work permits. It's so important, as you said, because um, the church um, here bonded out two asylum seekers from Honduras over two years ago, and neither mm -hmm. one of them yet have work permits mm -hmm. because the clock stopped too early on their cases. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, that we want to draw her attention to some of these issues and of course the terrible conditions at, at Adelanto um, and the family separation and some of those things. So I just want to let you know that we really appreciate all the work and the leadership that you're showing um, and let you know that, um, that we are taking action. And one thing that I, I hope that Clue and other organizations can do is start working for um, divesting from these private prisons like 
Adelanto, the Core Civic Group and the um, or Core Civic Corporation and Geo Group, because of the way that they have um, used the asylum seekers and immigrant issues as a means just to make profits. And so I think that all the churches and all of the and individuals should look at and if any of us have any kind of stock investments to make sure that we are not investing in these companies. So I hope that Clue and others can get behind that effort. If the, I think that the United Methodist Church is one, but the United Church of Christ does, is not part of that movement so far as I know. So it's a really important one that we not invest in these private prisons. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you. That's, thank you for highlighting that. Thank you for all, you, all the, the support you guys have. Uh, have given uh, immigrants and uh, around the work of pursuing justice and amplifying their voices. Yes, and we actually done some actions against Geo uh, in LA. Uh, one of the headquarters is right here in Culver City area. So, and we also work with uh, uh, I think never uh, Bendy Bendy Art and Never Again. Uh, uh, yeah, we highlighted you know uh, the, the like you said uh, why why is our money supporting uh, companies like Geo who uh, profit from the suffering of, uh, of, of, of humans, of our fellow human being, right? So we've done some actions against them. And, and I think, you know, I, my, my organization has always been about advocacy. The program about the asylum seekers, you know, we had to change our, for immigration, we had to change kind of our things, what we did uh, because of the last four years, right? That this administration, the last four years, their policies, like I said earlier, had no sense of humanity. Or compassion. So one of the only ways we could free people from detention centers uh, during that time was to uh, sponsor in their housing because of the policies that were going on at that time. But but yeah, we we done some advocacy around against Geo. Uh, in fact, this action uh, that we're doing in Passover Holy Week will highlight the issue of uh, Geo again and profiting, uh, and and that's why we're telling Adelanto city officials. Uh, why are you standing for why are you standing for immigration uh, prisons and not for human dignity, uh, right? And but thank you. Yeah, we need to continue to uh, advocate to uh, uh, to uh, federal officials that why is why are they giving money uh, to uh, uh, cost so much uh, suffering to a, another human being, another fellow human being, who are I say are my mothers, are my brothers, are my fathers, are my sisters, you know. Uh, we cannot be disconnected from this, from uh, this injustice and from this suffering that's happening because of the policies of, uh, of the four years. But the policies that have been in effect even before this uh, administration was there, uh, these, uh, uh, these these private for uh, run detention centers that are also bay, that also has some history about around uh, systematic uh, racism structure that are uh, part of that system targeting communities of color. So yeah, so thank you for bringing that and you know. Uh, crew continues to do advocacy around that, especially around the unaccompanied minors being locked up in detention centers. We just had a, uh, we just collected about 250 signatures uh, uh, of, uh, that, of a letter that was done by Peter Shea, who's, who has that famous case against the uh, US government on the treatment of unaccompanied minors in detention centers. And uh, that letter was gonna go to the new administration about the, uh, about the, uh, Treatment of minors and what needs to be fixed there uh, because they're locked up in these uh, uh, cages also. So yeah, so that we need to continue, like you said, uh, uh, to advocate to do advocacy around uh, uh, taking money out of uh, these companies that are profiting from the from human suffering. Yeah, yeah, and it's not a small amount. Uh, one year alone, the U.S. taxpayers gave over three billion dollars to the BI Corporation, which is the division of Geo. Which, mm -hmm. um, which handles the surveillance electronic via the app on the phone and through mm -hmm. the ankle bracelet, $3 billion. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. No, it it's, it's, hor it's horrific, it's horrific. And, and, and we, uh, uh, you know, we have helped sue uh, Geo and ICE. I told you about the 100 strikers three years ago, they were physically pepper sprayed in their private areas and physically assaulted by Geo at the, uh, when they were on a hunger strike protesting high bonds, uh, they were from Central America two years ago, and we just we just helped initiate another civil rights lawsuit against Geo and ICE uh, because uh, during the COVID outbreak they again pepper sprayed some people and shot them with rubber bullets. 
And then we're doing a lot of advocacy around the issue of with HD chemicals that were being pepper spray, uh, well, excuse me, not pepper spray, were being sprayed uh, during a, in, a lock in closures uh, in uh, Adelanto. And then a judge came down on them and uh, through all that advocacy work we were doing. And then the ACLU filed that lawsuit because of COVID, we were able to get released about 250 people back in October. And we, were, we set up a church in Victorville, a Methodist church to uh, as an emergency response center to help transition all those who didn't have any family members waiting for them uh, when they got released. But that was through a lot of the advocacy work around the continued advocacy work, highlighting the, the abuse by GEO uh, because of the medical negligence that they, they're known for and also because of the chemicals that they were spraying and the judge came down on them. But eventually that's not enough. We really need to uh, close down all these facilities. And, and take away money from these companies, like you said. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I have some news. I have some news as of today. I heard on NPR that the Biden administration is not allowing unaccompanied minors to be put in detention centers. They will be referred and trans transported to family members or sponsors, and they will not be put in detention centers anymore. That's as of today. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I've been following the news. We, we've been doing some, some work around the unaccompanied minors for a long time. And, uh, you know, Biden administration got really, got criticized a lot because they were putting these kids in detention in some facility in Texas. And one of our, one of our partners here at the Shotan Atlanta Coalition is Earth Justice. They do environmental justice. And uh, they were highlighting the fact that that facility that they were using, in, I think it was Texas, uh, was sitting around all these toxic uh, industries uh, around the, the land area there in the facility. And so the Biden administration got criticized a lot for using the same facilities that the Trump administration was using to uh, house unaccompanied minors in a facility that, that there's issues, not a, that this is first time I found out about the environmental hazards that were around that facility. So I'm glad that uh, they're uh, hearing uh, the outcry. Uh, the, you know, that's why it's very important that uh, we amplify these voices, right? Not only uh, for the unaccompanied minors, uh, amplify their voices of suffering in these horrific conditions, but also the asylum seekers that are locked up in detention and these, har uh, uh, right? So that amplifying the voice is very important. And, not being quiet about it. So they got they got some heat about it, but thankfully uh, I'm glad that you mentioned you you share those news and I'm glad that they're that they're doing something more humane uh, as far as the treatment of these uh, children. Yeah. Uh, I'm, my internet cut out for a little bit. I'm assuming we've transitioned to questions. And I just want to personally thank you, Guillermo, for an incredible presentation. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to raise them, put them in the chat. I have one myself. Um, I'm curious your opinion. It seems like so many people in our country are ignorant of the history of United States government involvement in Central and South America that's creating some of the modern day political issues that lead to violence in these countries. Um, would you agree with that? And if so, what are ways to help um, lay people or just people who don't have a lot of knowledge about these issues that are so complicated, what's a good way do you think to help them start learning about these, this history? Oh, no, yeah, I, 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 you know, our, 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 our government has had a, uh, like you said, a history of, uh, of uh, supporting uh, people who are evil, supporting people who are dictators. Uh, then you have the issue about the gangs. The gangs were, you know, those countries never had a culture of gang before. Uh, those uh, gangs, uh, a lot of our policies are so, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, let me try to, I'm trying to find the right way. Our policies, are, our past policies have almost dehumanized those communities and not really, you know, and then you got corporations going there and exploiting them. Uh, you got them, uh, uh, you know, you got uh, people being displaced from their lands by, uh, by sometimes government or, or, or corporations. And then you got the issue where you had the civil wars that, uh, you know, uh, where both Russia and, the, and our government was involved there. And that spearheaded a lot of the refugees freeing, uh, uh, especially El Salvador. And then not feeling, and then when they come here, they didn't feel welcome. They didn't feel, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, in some cases there was not that uh, that sense of humanity and compassion, right? So a lot of those young kids had a, a hard time uh, 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 here, you know, because of the way uh, they they get treated when they first arrive as immigrants, and then so that uh, created this culture of gangs, uh, and and then we started doing after the 9/11, we started putting all these uh, immigrants. Uh, into a, to countries that didn't have the infrastructure to help them uh, and give them resources to help them, uh, you know, uh, and now these countries are pretty much ruined by the gangs now. Uh, it's, it's horrific, the, the gang violence in, um, the, there's reported, uh, that report that I read to you, there's reported that there's about 85,000 gang members now throughout the, those regions, right? And unlike, you know, here where if you, have an issue, you could go to another state and seek refuge, right? Over there, the gangs are so violent and, 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 there's, and there's so many areas that it's hard for people to go from one little town to another because if they go from one town to another, maybe the other gang is there, the enemy gang. And these kids get forced, not recruited. They, uh, they are forced to either join the gang at 10, 12 years old. Just like during the Civil War, they were recruited to join uh, the guerrillas or the government uh, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, so yeah, a lot of our policies, I think it's important that people invite asylum seekers to share their stories. Uh, you know, usually I will have a, a, a asylum seekers be present with us, but uh, this time I, I couldn't make that happen. But uh, I think people need to be, uh, to hear their stories and, uh, right? And, uh, and, I, and, and they also need to hear the stories about uh, what our policies have done to them, uh, right? Uh, you know, uh, 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 how our policies have created some of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, this suffering, uh, because, you know, uh, like you said, many people are, are ignorant. And, and when you hear people talk about immigrants, they dehumanize them, they demonize them. You know, when you used to hear uh, the Trump administration talk about immigrants, it was not only about Central immigrants, that they were like, uh, un they were not well-deserved immigrants. And when, but he also said that about Africans, right? Uh, uh, when, he, he, when he called them that they were sh shed holes and stuff like that, excuse my language, right? So uh, this is, uh, this, that goes to, uh, you know, some white supremacy uh, tendencies and, and, uh, and, 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 and racism that's been perpetrated against communities of colors for a long time, that some of these immigration policies are, are, uh, are rooted on that. So I think, but I think inviting these asylum seekers to share their stories and inviting those who were affected by those policies uh, of our policies in the past, uh, it's to enlighten people and, and open their eyes, right? And, and uh, you know, so that way people can know really was, you know, uh, know really how our policies, I mean, our policies have side effects, you know, and our policies, our government policies, when I think about our government policies, they have no sense of humanity or compassion sometimes, and and and, and there's going to be there's going to be side effects of our policies. You know, uh, you know, uh, there's going to be human suffering that are caused by our policies, but but we don't see that. We, you know, uh, we're not connected. You know, sometimes our policies are not connected to the humanity of others in other people in other countries. You know, and uh, and for me, uh, and especially our values of faith. Uh, in my faith traditions, which is the Christian traditions, you know, and and including in the Hebrew tradition, the Old Testament, uh, you know, uh, anything that affects any human being in any part of the world affects me as a uh, because that's my uh, they are my brothers, my sisters, my mothers, my fathers. We uh, I am connected to them. I cannot be disconnected from them. So our policies uh, are we have to uh, and educate people and start thinking uh, and see the human human uh, connection to the suffering of others, uh, not just ourselves, right? And, and we seen this through, I mean, when the refugees from uh, Europe were coming during World War II and the Jewish uh, people were fleeing uh, that horrific evil, I mean, and they were coming in boats or in other ways. And, and then we, we, close, we close our eyes and, and we turn our back on them and, and, they were sent, and they went back and they were killed. I mean, uh, so, we have to uh, uh, keep amplifying these voices. It's, it's very important not to stay quiet. Uh, amplifying their voices. We don't. We this, these these immigrants, asylum seekers, do have a voice. 
uh, all we do is is open up those spaces for them to be able to amplify that voice, right? So that people can hear. It. I think that's very important there. Thank you so much, Guillermo. Other questions? Um, we have one in the chat. I think this is so important. Um, how the U.S. has created the current situation in Central America. Does anyone know of a good book that lays out this history? If you know a recommendation, um, put it in the chat. Yeah, I don't Do you know have, one, Gary? I don't have one in mind, but I could find out to, uh, uh, you know, I could look into it and, and, and probably uh, find a book a sure. and, and get back to you, uh, Yoya. Yeah. And there's, there's this colleague, there's this, uh, not colleague, but there's this partner uh, organization that's from Central America with us, because uh, we, we partner with uh, Caresen, but also with uh, other Central American agencies that have been around for a long time. So, uh, and Stephanie, if you ever want to invite one of them to talk about the history of, of the involvement, of U.S. involvement, uh, there's a couple of people that I can connect you with to invite, that you can invite them to speak about uh, that issue about how of the policies of the our government uh, have affected those countries uh, for such a long time, yeah. Oh, we've got a couple. Oh, thanks, Denise. Um, other questions? Oh, did you ever get the pictures uh, that I sent you? I did, yes. Let me share those. If there, if, and if people have more questions, okay, but I want to show you a, little, a couple of pictures and, and highlight some of these asylum seekers that were on those pictures. Can you see that? Okay, let me see. Uh, my screen is on the way here. Hold on a second. Okay, so so these are some of the this is the church in San Marino that took in uh, uh, some of the asylum seekers. You see Maria. She's in the front. She's from Mexico. She was a victim of human trafficking and sex trafficking by her husband in Mexico, uh, Mexicali. Uh, the the gentleman in back of her with the white T-shirt. Uh, he is actually from China, and his his story is very uh, very painful. He fled China. He was he was part of that uh, that community, that small community, the Muslim community. I think uh, I forgot what it's called. Uber. Uh, Uber. 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 Yeah. So he fled uh, to Turkey and and uh, took on a journey. But what's sad about his situation is so he he we sponsor him so he could get out of detention. He came to a church in San Bernardino, but then he transitioned about three days after he was able to connect with some friends, but. He hasn't spoken to his wife and children in three years. He doesn't know where they're at. He knows that the government of China took them into custody and locked them up somewhere. And he cannot speak publicly because, or call them, or he cannot call them by phone because they have the, the uh, if, they, if he connects with his family, they will persecute his family. But he hasn't seen them or talked to them in three years. So just recently, I learned to one of our uh, friend attorneys that's part of the National Lawyer Skill and that's part of the movement, Daniel Huang, uh, who, who's a really nice guy and has volunteered in some of my clinics and I work with and collaborate. I just recently learned from him that this gentleman became his client and I didn't know that he had fled to Canada to apply for asylum there, but he came back and he's suffering from severe depression, suicidal, and my wife just connected him with some uh, resources uh, because he hasn't seen his wife for three years in his family and he don't know where they're at. And he's like uh, really, uh, now that's really setting in on him even more and he's uh, suffering from that, uh, the gentleman. I, it's that, that's, that's the horrific situation uh, with, uh, of his case. And he's one of the one that we sponsor in the congregation and then uh, yeah, and then Maria, who's also an asylum seeker, and the, and the young man with the suit with the little red cross bag there, he was from Nigeria. He was a pastor that was locked up in other land for detention center. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is, uh, so this is him again on the left side. Uh, this is uh, George, he was from Nigeria. He was locked up in Adelanto, and this is Maria. Maria and, and, uh, and the gentleman on the left are the uh, asylum seekers. And, and this is Linda, she's the uh, deacon uh, of the church that gave us the five rooms uh, from the LA uh, diocese. But this is the church in San Bernardino that's hosting the uh, asylum seekers and the immigrants that have been released from detention. Go ahead and go to the next one. 
Uh, this is Maria again, and this is uh, uh, an, a Dre, a Dre, 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 he's from Eritrea. He was another asylum seeker that we took him to the church. Uh, he stayed there for about three months. And then uh, he, uh, he found an organization in Oakland where there's a big community of Eritrea folks. And they were very grateful that we were helping immigrants uh, from Africa also. Uh, and that's one something about crew, that crew, uh, uh, one, uh, every time we're in spaces with our immigrant rights organizations or other faith communities, we uh, make sure that we uh, go beyond just helping uh, uh, Latinx immigrants. We, we emphasize uh, opening our doors to all the immigrants that are suffering or are seeking refuge. So, so he, he was in our program and he has now transitioned. And Maria is now at another church also in, in Van Nuys that opened up for the program. Yeah. Go ahead and next slide. And there they are again here. And these people were people who were coming to donate items from other Episcopal churches. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, Anna and this is a young lady, uh, Angelica from Mexico. She's also an asylum seeker. Uh, the young lady to the right, she said one of our Lutheran churches in Los Angeles. Uh, she came with her partner. They both came to seek asylum. But when her partner got out of detention, he left her and abandoned her. Uh, and he went, uh, I guess, we found another uh, relationship. But She's in our program in uh, the Lutheran Church. And then on the left side is Anna. She was in detention for about a year in Adelanto. She was a victim of human and sex trafficking in the US by a Russian uh, a man that was actually married and he uh, uh, physically abused her and his wife at the same time. And then uh, made her to commit some crimes, financial crimes. And, um, and then she ended up winning her case in Adelanto uh, she should have never been praised in Adelanto. She served also prison time because of that crime, but she was actually the victim. She was manipulated by this man, uh, 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 forced her to do uh, many things. Uh, and she's now an advocate, uh, working to advocate for other immigrants too. And she uh, helps a lot of the immigrants sometimes when they get released. We also had another Russian house in the, uh, uh, at the church. And then we had a Russian that uh, we helped get out of Otay that, was, that went with his family in San Diego. Yeah, next one. And this is the Haitian family. This is Nai to the right is Nai. To the left is his wife and his nephew that they raised as a son. This is at the historic Methodist church in Los Angeles, Heritage. And this is Noemi in the middle uh, here to the, well, not in the middle, but next to the Snai on the left side. She's from the uh, Long Beach uh, uh, Israel Temple. She's one of the supporters of crew in our program. And here she brought a lot of donations to that church. Uh, a lot of the items that uh, that we need when they first arrive at the church. So Snai is the one that I was telling you that has the metal plates on his left leg and his family is uh, 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 fled to like 10 countries they had to cross before they uh, arrived in the US and were uh, apply, uh, asked for asylum, but they were put in detention and they're now housed in our uh, church in uh, Los Angeles, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, so those are some of the uh, beautiful uh, faces and and beautiful uh, immigrants, asylum seekers that we have, uh, that this program uh, helps and that you guys have helped too and supported uh, uh, in different ways in many other congregations. Yeah. Wow, it's so important to put faces with stories, to hear people's personal experiences. It reminds us that there's a lot of work to do and that, you know, every small action impacts a person's life. It's, Thank you for everything you do, Guillermo. We're honored to partner in any way we can. If we could give Guillermo a digital round of applause for sharing with us and being with us and continue to spread the word, everyone, about this important work. Um, you know, even with the new administration, as we learn, this, these issues don't go away. Uh, there's still so much that we have to do. So uh, thank you for your time, Guillermo. Well, thank you all for inviting me. It's always an honor to be part of the uh, UCC because uh, in, when I started as an organizer in Long Beach, I had many, I had Reverend Jerry, uh, Pastor Missy actually, Tagaloa from the Second Samoa Church, UCC. He's actually uh, a sanctuary church also, and he's taken in some immigrants for us in his church in Long Beach. Uh, but I, uh, I am grateful for the UCC and all the support they've given me as an organizer to my years with crew, uh, with the workers and with the immigrants. And thank you all for having me this morning. I hope to stay connected to you guys. And if you have any questions later down the road, and uh, and uh, and then I mentioned that we have an action, a Passover Holy Week action being organized by Christians and uh, rabbis right now. 
on March the 30th. It's going to be a, a car caravan to the Adelanto City Hall. Uh, we'll send you that information also, okay? Sounds great. Thank you. See everyone in worship in just a few minutes. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.